You can see these. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, well, it's good to see everybody. Um, I'm sorry to miss last month. I was on vacation in California, um, or more appropriately, as my wife likes to call it, a trip with kids to California, which is exactly what it was. Um, but uh, it's good to be back here with you all this evening. Um, I wanted to talk tonight about development in Poolsville, which um, I think is, I don't know that there's a more contentious issue you will find in town than, um, you know, new developments. If you want to stack the, uh, the town hall full of people, just propose a new development and you will get that outcome. Um, but I, I wanted to address it for a couple of reasons. One, uh, you know, I was, I was born here. I, I kind of been in and out of the town since the eighties. And so I've kind of seen it grow up to a certain extent with some new developments that I have some memories of coming along. And so I've been, you know, interested in, in the development for a while. Second, as I mentioned, I think it's an issue that, um, you know, I think like suburban development is not necessarily like the sexiest sounding topic, but I do think it's actually quite interesting here in a small town, um, like Poolsville, and and my hope is that um, I, I know that some of you uh, you know on here have maybe been involved in those discussions in the past. Maybe you were on town council, or you were in, in planning board meetings, or or whatever. Um, and and also for those of you that are longtime residents, um, I'm hoping that maybe talk of some of these developments being built and whatnot kind of just jogs some some good memories of of um, that that taking place. And then finally, I think it's a really good time to talk about this issue because one of the requirements of the town um, uh, council is every 10 years to release a, a master plan, which is essentially um, a vision for what the next 10 years um, of, of town development should look like. And the last plan came out in 2011, which means that the new one in 2021 is very much, my understanding is very much in development and in the works. And um, I, I've talked to a couple of members on um, town council who are very interested in getting input and feedback from, from residents as they should. And um, I think if we're going to have public conversations about what the next 10 years should look like, maybe we should spend some time thinking about what the last 50 or 60 years have looked like to kind of inform some of those decisions. So I think this is kind of a, a timely topic to, to bring up now. And I, I think what's fascinating to me is when we think about development in Poolsville, um, it, you know, obviously we have a deep history. Most of the time when I'm on here talking with you all, it's about things in the 1800s, people, events, the Civil War, whatever. Uh, if you go back and you see that kind of overhead shot of Poolsville in 1951 there, if I was able to show you an overhead shot in 1851, I suspect it wouldn't look all that different. There wasn't a whole lot of growth that took place um, over, you know, those prior 100 years, you know, maybe tens or 20s of, of people, new families, some new houses here and there. But generally speaking, that population level remained relatively stable. And then all of a sudden, when we start kind of looking at, at the timeline of development and looking at our population numbers, when you get to 1970, something quickly changes, right? And, and in, in 1970, we have, you know, a couple of hundred people. And by 2020 today, you know, we're up around 53, 5,400 people, right? So that's some, some pretty significant, it's almost 20x growth um, over the last 70 years. And what I've tried to do here on the screen is at the bottom, just kind of highlight the, the specific, well, not all of them, but most of the neighborhoods in town um, and, and when they came online and were built in town um, and I think like as I was going through this and, and thinking about it and trying to better understand development issues here in town, um, it, it kind of became clear to me there's almost what I see as three kind of separate phases over this time period of, of development and growth. The first phase really begins around 1970 and it lasts till 1976. Um, I'm going to call that the Helmos era um, from Mayor Gene Helmos and I'll talk about him in a moment. And then from 86 to around 2000 is, is kind of the phase two part. I'm going to call that the McDonald's era because that was kind of the big news in the late 80s when I think it was 89 when McDonald's came online. I remember being there on the first day. It was very exciting. And then the, the third era, which I think we're still in, I think is ongoing, um, 
I, I would say is kind of the, the post great recession development era, right? Starting around 2010 and kind of continuing onward for, I don't know how long, maybe that'll be, that'll be part of kind of that master plan uh, development process. So we'll start in this phase one in the Helmos area. So for those of you who have been around town for, for a while, um, the name Helmos or Gene Helmos is probably pretty familiar uh, to you. If, if you haven't been around long, if you, if you know of like Helmos Park in town, it's named after this individual in the suit right in the center of the picture there. Um, Gene Helmos was a, a long-standing resident uh, of the town. He was on uh, the, the town commission for, for a number of years. Um, this picture is actually of him, I believe, in the late 60s or early 70s. And the building right there is that, um, it's now that AT&T building next to the post office in the center of town. It's that very kind of nondescript brick building. You kind of pass by it a million times and don't even realize it's there. So it was when it first opened. Um, and he's showing some executives from a telecom business there on the left, you know, kind of the open the doors. And on the right are uh, other members of Poolsville's town commission and, and their wives. So Gene Helmos is a really interesting character. Um, he, he, like kind of a side note, he lived in this, this really cool old home, um, which is really very close to the center of town. It's another place you've probably passed many times, but I spent a lot of time at the old home next door where the Evans family lives. Um, and so I had the privilege of being yelled at many of times by, um, by Gene. And, and to be honest with you, when I was, you know, seven, eight years old, I thought he was just kind of this grumpy old guy next door. I had no idea what his backstory was, but his, his story is really amazing and interesting. So Gene Helmos was born in Manhattan. And at uh, the outset of World War II, he joined the Army Air Corps, which was kind of the precursor to the US Air Force. And he was shot down in World War II and was a POW in a German prisoner camp for 10 months. Um, and he eventually was, was freed by Allied forces, came back home um, and became a journalist um, and, and moved his family um, to Poolsville, working out of the DC area. Uh, but he wrote this book, The Wrong Side of the Fence, which is about his experience as a POW. You can go on Amazon and buy it right now if you want. Um, and when he returned to town in, in 1961, he was, you know, he's very, if I remember correctly, he was a pretty vocal individual. He wasn't, he wasn't too worried about letting you know what he thought about different things. Um, and he ran for town commission and he ended up becoming the head of the town commission, right? So in Poolsville, I'm sure many of you know town government, there's technically not a mayor. Um, but as, as the president of the commission, you are sometimes kind of referred to as the mayor. And so you'll see him refer to as Mayor Helmos, even though really he's just another member of the, of the town commission. So Gene takes over or here is, jumps onto the commission um, in the 60s. And so just as kind of a refresher, this is just a closer shot of what I showed you before. So in, in the 50s, this is the closest I could get to 1960 with overhead imagery, but in the 60s, there's not much here. There's no West Plea, no Wesman, no elementary school. The high school is there, but it's, it's very, very small compared to what we kind of see today. Um, so there's not a whole lot of infrastructure here, right? And at the same time, through the 50s, um, I-270 is being built. I think it was officially completed in, in 1960. Uh, I-495 is being built. I think it was finished officially in uh, 61. And the, the town commission and, and Gene kind of recognized um, there was potentially some opportunity for growth. And there was based on, I've seen kind of interviews from him, with him in some of these articles here, um, there was a lot of frustration in town that because we had a relatively small population, we were effectively being pushed around by the county council, right? And, 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 um, and you know, I suppose that just to some extent, if you think about the fair access that's going on right now with getting a school, there's, I think there's still an extent of, of that feeling. Um, but the, the commission's view was um, if we can, um, you know, maybe increase the population, um, and um, you know, gain a little bit more power, uh, we can maybe call our own shots a little bit more and kind of be free of, of kind of that, that heady hand from the council. And so they decide they want to develop, but the problem that they have at this point in time is apparently Poolsville was like, when it rained, the, there was no water drainage, right? There's people in the forties that describe this place as like living in a swamp. So a lot of these areas around outside of the scent, like the very center of town were very, very wet. 
And so in the 60s, uh, the, the commission um, has a, a new sewer system built and it's completed in 66. And it's such a big accomplishment that the town commission literally throws a party, a celebration for the town at what was then the, the middle senior high school for the completion of this sewer, right? Now, I don't know about you, I've never been to a party to celebrate the completion of a sewer system, but this was big news. Like this was a big accomplishment, right? It's just kind of a testament to how big of a deal it was. And what it allowed was developers who had long had their sights on Poolsville to come in and begin building. And we see kind of um, initial stages of this in 1970. You can see kind of the, the first parcel of, of the westerly neighborhood coming into play there. You can see the elementary school has been um, built. Notice it's a U shape. If you know the, if you look at the elementary school from above today, it's a it's a square. So here it's a U shape. We don't have that one wing on the side. And I'll show you another picture of that in a minute. Um, but so we start seeing this development occur in the 70s. Um, and you know, a few years later, when we look at some some shots from from airplanes that came over you can see the elementary school there right it's kind of missing on the left side it's missing that wing where the gym and the, the media center now is you can see the new westerly neighborhood up on the upper left and then the bottom left i just think is a cool picture so that is whalen commons in the foreground in the bottom left so that, so it's if you know randy davis you know he's on here all the time that's his white house um there and and the the new town hall would be you know to the left of those homes um, of course it's not there in the 70s um, just kind of an interesting view so this development continues um throughout throughout the early 70s and you can see westerly starts becoming built i think my house is like right there which is kind of cool to see uh you can see that the high school is is kind of expanding now we have a track here right the elementary school by 79 they have finished that wing so it's now that square that we recognize and uh in wesmond has been has been completed now an issue arises pretty so we've got this new sewer that comes in the late 60s by the early 70s it was clear that we were going to need better uh sewer capacity with uh, the, the the wastewater treatment plant and there was also concerns about um, well water capacity and there were there was apparently enough concerns about the wastewater that there was actually a state a state mandated moratorium on building from 76 to 86. so when i showed you that screen earlier and there's kind of that that end of the first era and there's a 10-year gap between this and until the second one starts it's really a result of this moratorium where there was essentially no building taking place as the town kind of reassessed how are we going to raise the funds to improve this wastewater capacity? And, um, and more shots here in the 80s, you can see what the high school looks like there, which is, uh, you know, again, to strengthen Fair Access's argument, I don't think it looks any different today, right? Um, and, then, and then on the right, again, just another shot of, uh, of Westerly. Um, but so, so we get this moratorium. We can't build any more developments until we, until we fix this capacity issue. And then in the in the early, I believe it's 84, um, but feel free to correct me on that. I think 84, the new wastewater treatment plant is, is constructed. Um, it improves that capacity. And, and in 86, the, this moratorium is lifted. Um, now, I'm calling it the, the McDonald's era, even though that really didn't happen until around 89. But you can see that's a, a literal article from, from the, uh, the Baltimore Sun that was running in the late 80s. And... Um, I just think it's like a fast times in Poolsville. I mean, for Poolsville, yes, but relative to anywhere else, not so much, right? But in the late 80s, we kind of start seeing this, this second phase begin, okay? Um, and you can see there, if you compare 79 to 2002, at first glance, it doesn't look all that different, but when you really start thinking about where is Seneca Chase, where is Hunter's Run, um, Tama, right? You start seeing them pop up on that right side map and they are not there um, in in 79 right and that's um where we start seeing some of the the kind of main street um, commercial infrastructure pop up as well remember i mean another one of the arguments for development is if you want to have local businesses you have to have people that can go to these businesses right and i mean i think that that's an issue we still think about and talk about a lot today is are there enough people here to to support small businesses or not and what kind of businesses um and in the late 80s i think is when we really start to see 
um, you know, a lot of these, which are frequently now vacant, but a lot of these commercial lots kind of spread throughout the, the main uh, commercial sector of, of town to include McDonald's. And just, I just kind of wanted to show some, some actual like examples because I think it's fascinating to look at. So when you look at Seneca Chase, which I think was started around 89 or 90, um, and you know, you, you compare it to today, like you, you can see, um, you know, in the early nineties, it was still very much in development. You can tell these lots are not, people are not actually living here yet, right? This is, this is all very fresh. Um, and then obviously we know what that looks like today. Um, this is, so this is Hunter's run, um, in 93. And I think th this is really interesting. So, um, we can see it developing. You can kind of tell by the baseball fields. Again, that's, that's Helmo's park, just to go back to, to Gene Helmo's at the top there. Um, if, if I was to go back just like a few years prior to 93, what you would see in Hunter's run is a single farmhouse with a driveway that extends all the way out to Hughes road. Um, so quite, quite far. Um, and then, and then Hunter's Run came in, they built it in multiple sections. So this section I'm showing it here is really actually the first, the earliest section of Hunter's Run, and then it proceeded south um, from there. And then if we look at Tama, um, which was very much in construction in, in the early 90s, um, if you look at the left, you can see there's still plenty of lots there that are, that are under construction. Um, but you can you can really tell as you kind of look at the overhead map of of there there was definitely planning for how you know roads would fit into each other how they would link in together, um, and I'll show you a picture of the 2011 um, the 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 vision for what the roads would look like by 2021, and it's it's incredibly accurate to what it looks like today, right? So so there is there's a lot of planning here. This is not just you know, on a whim by any means. Um, and, um, you know, slowly this population is growing um, through this kind of second phase through the 90s up until around um, 2000. So in, in 2000, um, you know, I, I couldn't necessarily find, you know, the moratorium on building is, a, is an obvious reason why there's no building. But in, in around 2000, 2001, when, when I saw kind of development stop, it was a little bit unclear as to why that was taking place. So I sent a note to, um, to Wade Yost, as well as to, to Jim Brown and to Randy, just trying to get their thoughts. And they, they basically all point it to the same thing, which from what I can tell is always the issue in Poolsville, which is it's always about water. Um, whether it's well capacity or wastewater sewage capacity, one or the other. Um, but, but from what I can gather around 2000, 2001, there was, there was kind of a, a couple of headwinds against development. So one was the, the town, generally speaking, after you know, a lot of building through the 90s um, was, was generally feeling fairly um, anti-development um, in, in, in their views. The second was the town had been apparently slow um, to find more well capacity. And so they were in the process of doing that, but it, it resulted in a little bit of gap. And the third was we were still dealing with some of the, the wastewater sewage um, capacity issues. Um, so that kind of slowed building down. And then what happened was we had a couple of developers come on board in the mid, you know, around 2005, 2006, but then the great recession hits in 08. And of course, nobody's gonna build new homes right at that point in time. So that kind of further delayed things. Um, but pretty much as soon as that started to lift, um, we, start, we start seeing further development around 2009, 2010 to start kind of this, this third phase. So this map, and I know it's really hard to see, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. I couldn't really figure out how to make it any bigger with that was still showing it. But what you're looking at here is in the blue are the streets, as of 2011, are the streets that were in place. And the red streets are the ones that were envisioned as part of the master plan to come online between 2011 and 2021. And I'll tell you, it's, it is pretty much spot on. Every, everything that you see in red there is, is there today. If I show you the overhead, it's, it's there exactly in the same way that it's been planned out as it should be, right? Um, the one thing I did see, and you can see kind of my uh, exclamation part marks and question marks there is, 
and if anybody knows more about this, I might have to send a note to like Jim or Carrie or somebody in the commission, but I guess there was a plan to connect cattail into the backside of Tama 2, which is, which is a very interesting place to have a road. Um, there is, I've noticed there is actually space between homes for it. It's clearly envisioned. So I don't know if maybe that's something that will remain on the town plan and, and come to fruition over the next 10 years, or if it'll be dropped, or I don't know what the issue is there, but that was the only thing um, that I could find in looking at that vision from 10 years ago that's not come to fruition. Um, so, so good on the town planners. And again, you know, we look at, um, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, uh, at Poolsville High School, you know, across the street was just open farmland. Uh, and then in 08, right as, I mean, the, the recession is very much still going on here, but the developers are already coming in and starting to clear this land. And then in 2020, um, we see, you know, Stony Springs fully online. And it was interesting to me, I didn't, I didn't know this, hopefully I'm not sharing inside baseball, but one of the commissioners told me that uh, Winchester Homes actually paid the town um, a good amount of money to actually get a year jump on the construction of Brightwell uh, Crossing because they knew that you know you would have um, individuals coming in to buy homes and they wanted to be the first on the market. Um, so you see kind of Stony Springs almost one year out in front of, of Brightwell here. Um, again, here's Brightwell. It's got that really cool old farmhouse and farmland right in the center, which was at the time very much kind of out on its own. And now it's kind of an island within a within a very nice new neighborhood. Um, but you can see how they've, you know, um, again, taken that that space and developed. And then we look at um, the reserve at Brightwell, which is which is very much ongoing. Right. I literally have very good friends of mine that are moving into their new home here next week on this street. So it's it's still in the process of being built. Um, and of course, you, you know, Westerly Grove is ongoing at the top of Bodmer. Um, we've got, you know, I suppose ongoing discussion and I don't want to get into a fist fight with anybody about the, uh, the, uh, the property in the center of town, which I suppose will be coming here in some shape or form. Um, so, so this, this third phase of development very much, as I mentioned, is ongoing. Um, and I, you know, I suspect that it, it will continue um, as we as we move forward. I think for me, the questions are about, and, and as we kind of um, start thinking about the, the master plan, um, you know, right now we have kind of this stated capacity of around 6,500 residents. I've heard, I've heard nothing to indicate that that's no longer the case. Um, um, I, you know, I just kind of wonder sometimes, you know, it, how true is that? Will that remain true? Um, you know, we have these limiting factors around water and, and sewage treatment. Um, to, you know, to what extent are those actually limiting factors versus factors that can be, you know, moved? Um, and then I think like that third piece, which is always the core question of this town that I don't, I don't have the answer to. I don't know that anybody necessarily does. It's somewhat subjective, but what is what is that right balance between population growth um, and, and trying to maintain kind of the, the small town character that I think we all love, but at the same time being able to support a certain level of, of small businesses in town, right? It's a, it's a, that's a difficult balance to find if it's, if it's findable. Um, but I think that's kind of like the core question as we move forward and think about, um, you know, a hundred years from now when somebody else is giving this presentation and they're looking back and thinking about these decisions, um, it will be interesting to see what does it, what does it look like? Do we have kind of that flat population from now to then, like we did from the civil war to the 1960s, or are we going to see something drastically different? Um, and I'm sure that there's people in town that would like to see both outcomes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's just something to keep in mind. And I think, you know, my, I guess my, my one kind of hope is that as as the commission kind of starts talking about this plan this summer, um, that you all remain engaged on it. I know I will from especially from my vantage point on um, Countryside Alliance and and uh, Historic Medley District. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that's kind of those are the key items that I wanted to to address here. And we'll do questions in a minute. I also wanted to do talk two other quick things. Um, so First is two years ago, um, we did a, uh, 
I did a home tour and we hit, uh, I think six houses. Um, we took 40 people on a bus, show them around for the day, um, six houses throughout the ag reserve. I thought it went really well. It seemed like everybody enjoyed it. Um, and there was a lot of momentum. And then of course COVID hit. Uh, I, we, we are going to do it again. I'm, I'm dedicated to getting this done again. Um, I already have a number of home owners who have kind of notionally committed to me um, that they will, they will open their homes. Of course, we'll have to kind of monitor the deal with COVID and, and variants and all of that and make sure that we're doing it safely. Um, but I'm thinking late September, early October is going to be probably the time frame there. So if, if that's something that's of interest, um, if you're on Facebook, you know, make sure to, to follow my page um, because I'll be probably posting about it there. Um, but also I'll, I'll make sure that the senior uh, group is, is getting updates um, as rapidly as I'm putting them out as well so that um, they can be shared with you all. Cause I know that, you know, you guys are, have an interest in this and frankly, I like you all better than most of the people in town. So I'd rather you all were there on the tour with me than others. So um, I will, I will make sure that you are um, kept in the loop on that. And then secondly, in, in a more kind of serious note, and I hope I'm not breaking this news to anybody, um, but we had a really sad loss earlier this week um, with the passing of, of Gwen Reese. So for those of you who don't know Gwen, um, she has, she's a, a longstanding resident of, of the Poolsville area, um, you know, from the, the African-American community of Sugarland. Um, she has been doing just unbelievable work through her, her organization, the, the Sugarland Ethno History uh, Project to really catalog the, the lives and experiences and, and artifacts um, of, of the Sugarland community members. Um, and so, you know, deeply saddened about, about her passing, although I, I would say I, I feel somewhat comforted by the fact that she has spent just so much time um, documenting this stuff. So I think the, the stories of that community as well as, as her um, will, will certainly live on. Um, you know, literally on the day that she passed, there were um, archaeologists on the site in Sugarland actually doing more work um, on her behalf that she had asked them to do a while ago. So it, the work continues. And, you know, there's many of us that will do everything we can to continue to help ensure that that work um, continues, but but certainly no less kind of um, reduces the, the loss here. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that really important member of the community, um, a difficult loss. Uh, but just, and ultimately just a really, really good, kind person who was always great with me. I know Glenn was on here. We spent a lot of time with her. Um, so, so yeah, not to end on a somber note, but um, I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge that because that's a, it's a, she's a quite important figure um, um, here in the community. Okay. Um, with that, I am happy to take questions on any and all of this. I see the first question in the chat is where did the students go to elementary school before PES hmm. was built? Yeah, it's a good question. I, so I was actually thinking about this myself too. Like when, when we go back to like the 1800s, there's, there's a bunch of small single room schoolhouses kind of across the area. But I think you're more referring to like 50s, 60s. Um, I, so, uh, and, and somebody correct me, I'm sure there's somebody here that knows the answer to this. I, I think that the high school was actually K through 12 at one point, and then it was just the middle high. Um, so I, I, I would suspect they were actually at the high school, but I could be wrong about that. The next question I see says, what happened to the farmhouse that was at the mm -hmm. center of Hunter's Run? Yeah, so, so that's an interesting one. So, um, the, so the, if you're ever in Hunter's Run, and you're kind of at the top of the hill on Hoskinson. There's that there's that big white house on the corner. It's kind of like the biggest one in the neighborhood. And you'll notice next to that house, there's like the ruins of this old stone structure sitting there. That was, I believe, um, the enslaved quarters um, for what was a farmhouse next to it. Um, and uh, it was actually a farm from the Poole family. Um, the farmhouse, so I've gone back and looked, we can kind of see some overhead and we have some of those airplane pictures from the seventies. I think the old farmhouse came down a long, long time ago. There was a, a smaller home there in the seventies that looks like it wasn't that old. It was just kind of like a little bungalow. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, they, when, 
that they took that small house down when they when they built the, the new neighborhood but to the credit of of the builders they left um kind of the the structure of of the old enslaved quarters there um so it's still sitting there you can see it it's quite interesting to look at um the owners there are, are great um and they are doing everything they can to make sure it kind of stays up in in the shape that it's in but but it, yeah it's still there you can still see it yeah, I actually remember trick or treating and having yeah. them have a fire set yeah. up yep. there. Yep. Yeah, it's they um fascinating. Yeah, mm -hmm. the owners told me they like to do um dinners out there sometimes with friends and like so it's in, it's a it's an interesting setting. Um it's a, I'm glad that it's it's still there in in you know, it's not in great shape, but it's definitely still there to kind of tell a story. The next question is how are the goals of supporting local businesses affected by the outrageously high rents charged by mostly out of town property owners. I so I personally think this is one of the biggest issues in town that is not openly discussed, which is um, not only are the rents in these places just astronomically high, but I get the sense that they're also not very transparent. Um, it, uh, how are the goals? Yeah, the goals are not supported by that, from what I can tell. Um, I, I've had this discussion with commissioners before too. I think that I think it's, I think it's a big problem when you actually start digging into the rents that are being charged at some of those places, and you think about trying to start a small business. I mean, it. it I mean, it's hard to figure out how anybody would, you know, make that financial justification. I mean, depending on what your business is, I guess. But um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's something that should be addressed for sure. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it, it's that classic, you know, I respect the property owner's right to charge what they want to charge. Um, but I, I don't know, it seems like there should be some, some balance there. The next question says, isn't development and population limited by space available within town centers? Yeah, I, I think that's certainly true. Um, I, but um, a couple things, I mean, one is I, I I think there's still um, there's still you know plenty of room where other development could take place. I also and I'm not I'm not an expert on this and I don't want to speak for the for the planning commission, but I I think that the town boundaries have been moved previously and they can be expanded um, in in certain ways. Um, I'm sure that there's got to be some larger discussion with kind of zoning requirements around the ag reserve and whatnot, but. So, so to an extent, yes, but I think that those limits potentially can can move, um, if, uh, assuming you know some votes are cast or something. But I, like, I don't know that the limits are necessarily fixed for for indefinite, um, you know, the future. We can go ahead and open up now. If anyone would like to ask questions, just feel free to unmute or send your questions in the chat. I see one that says, is well capacity the constraining factor? So again, I'm sure somebody on this call knows the answer to this better than I do. My, my understanding is that well capacity is less of an issue today than it was maybe 20 years ago and that it's more of the wastewater and sewage treatment capacity that's the bigger issue. Um, I could be wrong on that, but that's, that's kind of, that's my understanding based on discussions with members of the town. Um, town board. I have a question. Um, have you read the Thrive 2050 and are you confident that that's going to do anything to save the Ag Reserve in the future? Yeah, I've read it. Um, no, I'm not confident um, that it will. I think that that's, that's actually something for, um, I'll, I'll tell you that the, the Montgomery Countryside Alliance is, is working that and looking at that and, and sending um, comments and reviews back um, up to, to the county council on that. Um, I mean, th this is not necessarily, I guess it's, it's certainly linked to the town. Obviously, you know, technically within the town boundaries, you're not in the ag reserve technically. Um, but I, I do have significant concerns with the future of the ag reserve. Um, and I think they're largely tied to the makeup of the county council. Um, so I, it's, I, I guess the only thing I would say that I'm, that I'm optimistic about is there are a lot of people that are watching those things very closely and very much ready to fight. Um, 
but it's going to require, I think, I mean, I think this is part of the reason why I, I, my specific angle that I've taken is kind of old homes, but there's a whole lot of other issues related to the ag reserve. But um, I think it's really important that people are publicly kind of talking about the things that we have today that we want to keep um, because from, from what I can tell, there's plenty of, of individuals that would love to encroach upon this and, and find ways to, to change it, right? And so it's going to take really a group effort um, to ensure that that does not take place. And I kind of view Poolsville as a little bit of, you know, it's kind of considered the hub of the Ag Reserve, but I also think it's kind of the guardians of the Ag Reserve, at least this Western side of the Ag Reserve. Um, so yeah, so that's going to be, that's going to be a team effort moving forward. Yeah, because the overriding theme of that seems to be housing. Yeah. Wherever, wherever and whenever. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, if you look at the slate of individuals running for, for county, not to get into politics, but if you look at the slate of individuals running for, for um, county council and, and for the head of the council in, in 22, um, you know, it might be worth spending some time looking at their backgrounds and figuring out what you think that they'll do with, with uh, their, their position should they, should they achieve it. In terms of Poolsville development, of course, with new plans coming out, it's one of those things that's so hard to predict which way it will go. But just based on trends of development in our history, where do you think Poolsville development will go in the next 20 to 50 years? Well, I mean, I think, I'm, so I guess I would say is like, I, I don't want to make or come across as kind of um, anti-development because I'm not. I think that there's, there's a balance to be found somewhere. And I'd also say, you know, I've just talked about a whole lot of development, but um, Jim Brown made, made the point to me when I asked him about this, which I, you know, I think is potentially irrelevant here that if you, if you look at kind of the growth rate of Poolsville and you compare that to a lot of places in the area, Clarksburg or Urbana, for example, we're actually moving at a snail's pace. Now, that's one argument. The other side would say, well, yeah, but we were never, we never wanted to be a Clarksburg or Urbana. So that's, you know, that's apples to oranges, right? So, so there's a, there's a lot of that. Um, I, I think, you know, assuming that that, that 6,500 person capacity remains the same, assuming that the economy stays strong, assuming that the high school stays strong, right? I think that's, I think the high school being a magnet school is quite significant. Um, I, I would suspect that we will continue to move towards that 6,500. I think the big question for me is um, what happens when we get there? Um, you know, do we just, do we stop? <laughs> do we do we hold or then what happens? Um, and so I, you know, I would be an advocate for slowly moving towards the sixty five hundred and not kind of running towards it. Um, I think that that's probably where we're going over the next twenty years. Um, but what this place looks like sixty years from now is is I think anybody's uh, question. If we have any more questions, feel free to unmute or send them in the chat. Penny, I'm very excited to hear about the historical home tours. Um, yeah, yeah. We would love to help promote that and- Absolutely, um, yeah. No, I'm, I, yeah, it was a really fun day. In fact, my, my biggest concern with it is just figuring out how do we get, like I had a lot of people who were understandably frustrated last time just because you know, there's only so many people I can bring through somebody's house, right? And so I, I'm trying to kind of balance that with the fact that a lot of people want to do it, right? And so how do we, how do we make this work to where everybody's kind of happy at the end? Um, so I'm trying to think through that right now. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that we're, you know, starting to get back to a place where we can do these kinds of things. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. Of all the developments, which one do you think had the biggest impact on Poolsville's economy? Oh man, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I, I guess you would have to say the, the probably Westley just because it was the first one, right? I mean, it was like the first one to come on board. It, it changed, you know, all of a sudden. I mean, I think it's like it's not so much the developments that changes the economy. It's also if you think about this story of like suburban development, 
in Poolsville. It's 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 unique to us in the sense that it's here in Poolsville, but this is something that's happening across the country. I mean, if you think about like the TV show, The Wonder Years, it's basically takes place in any town USA, right? And it's essentially the story of this new idea of the suburbs and this new idea of, you know, having I-270 and 495 open where now like this idea of a commute is a thing. People can commute to work and back. There's road capacity. Um, and so you've got all of these kind of factors kind of coming into play at the same time right there around 1970 that I think really kind of took this from um, a, a pretty sleepy kind of farm village to whatever you would consider it today, right? Certainly not a New York City, but it's not a small farm village either. So it's something that's closer to the farm village side, but um, certainly different, so. Penny, if you'd like some me. input. Oh. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, if you'd like some input on uh, what I think about the population growth and everything, I believe the 6,500 is going to stand for at least the next 10 or 20 years. Okay. And some of the limiting factors is the water, wastewater treatment, the availability of land within the current town limits. Right. And the fact that uh, even if annexation were to be discussed, which after the Saudi yeah, that's right. Poor deal and everything. It's yeah. you mentioned annexation, and that you know, there's a red flag that goes up right away. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. Most of uh, what surrounds Poolsville now is the ag reserve, and then even within the ag reserve, you have a lot of properties that have uh, either environmental easements on them, conservation easements, agricultural easements that would take an awful lot of uh, legal finagling, I guess, to try to get those eradicated because they're supposed to be perpetual. Right. So there's really right. not that much developable land left within the Poolsville town limit. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's, yeah. A, there's a section, that little stretch of road that uh, is over near Cattail. Yep. Yep. I believe when we did the 2011 master plan that uh, that came up because there is a plot of land over there that uh, was part of the Warther property. Mm -hmm. And Jameson has some land over there also that uh, okay. I'm not sure if that could still be developed or not. Right. But, uh, right. If so, then initially a road there would be uh, very good for emergency vehicles and stuff and that sort of thing. Right. So that was it, but that's, that's not even on the drawing board now. Right. You guys, you guys did and, it. And to get back, you had mentioned Winchester Homes and uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, offering money or something like that. At that time, with water and sewage being like a hot commodity, right? The right. town commissioners had decided that uh, they would have developers have proffers where they could say, well, I'll build a new water tower, I'll build a new uh, high school, I'll build this, I'll do that for you, and I'll do that. So it's almost like a little bidding. Gotcha. War. Uh, yeah. And at the time, the Planning Commission, in deciding what development should go first, came up with five criteria. And they were weighted somewhat. Mm -hmm. So if it was, they were like concentric circles. So if a developer was closer to the center of town, that was like a, a four point bonus or something over one that would be farther from the center of town okay. Okay. and how much they offered the town to be able to uh, start the development and everything also got a weight to it. Hmm. And then they were, I guess, objectively, all the weighted scores were added up and it was determined that Winchester gotcha. to go uh, first because they were offering the town the most at the time. Right. Okay. okay. That, that's good context. I didn't know that. And, and George, what um, years were you? You were on the planning commission, correct? Yeah, I was 
chairman for 16 years and I was on the planning commission for 20. Wow. Well, you, you guys did a good job. I think I, from what I can tell, I did, I did the last two master plans. Yeah, no, I mean that last master plan seems pretty spot on from what I can tell. Um, so, um, Okay, well, the other you. limiting capacity is uh, the fact that even if the wastewater treatment plant were to be doubled in size, it wouldn't meet state uh, mm. conditions because in the uh, dry Seneca Creek, you're only allowed to discharge X amount of phosphorus, potassium, right. you know, copper, right. lead, et cetera. And the fact that we would be putting more right. treated water, it's not treated to the extent that you're taking all of those minerals and metals and stuff out of the water, right. even though it might be pure, pure enough to drink. It may not you know, right. meet right. State, state standards for uh, that. And they also, the state also in 2013 reduced some of the chemicals that are allowed in water. They came up with an aquatic life standard as opposed to like a human standard. Hmm. Hmm. So an aquatic life standard for like a heavy metal is like one tenth of what is allowed in our drinking water. <laughs> and so because of that, you could, like I said, you could double the wastewater treatment plant, but we wouldn't be able to purify the water going into dry Seneca Creek enough gotcha. to gotcha. allow that. So it would have to be built on a different stream bed, I guess, feeding into the Potomac River rather than dry Seneca Creek. Uh, so, interesting. So yeah, it's a lot involved. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Kenny? Yeah. Um, Adam DeBaugh here, Assistant Director of WUMCO. Hey, Adam. Uh, as you may know, we are outgrowing our present location at the Baptist Church and are looking for a new space, have been for the past oh, year and a half or so, um, especially since Miss Jane Stearns died. Mm. Um, and I, I can tell you the rents in town are incredible. Yeah. Um, we, even the historic buildings, um, uh, like the pool houses, um, uh, the Suns, uh, uh, were were expensive, but also not in good enough shape to hold eight thousand pounds of food. Sure, sure. You know, without the the uh, floor collapsing into the basement. Um, We've talked to a number of, of, of um, the larger spaces, and the um, the owners are um, quite content to leave them vacant. Um, they take the, take it off on their taxes, and they probably make more money um, leaving their property vacant than they do renting it. Um, and so um, they're perfectly happy charging a lot. Um, but I know of at least three businesses in, in downtown that have closed because of rent issues. Yeah. And um, that to me is a, is a tragedy uh, and, a, and a, a real detriment to the town. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, no disagreement. Um, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I see a question that says, will the resolution of the Whites Ferry issue determine growth in Poolsville or is it not relevant? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how relevant it is. I mean, I, I, I don't know offhand. Um, I mean, I've heard of some people actually leaving town because they worked in Northern Virginia and just access to work was too difficult from here without the ferry. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure that whether it stays offline or comes back online is going to have a drastic effect. But, but again, I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I don't know, but it, it would surprise me if it did one way or the other. The last question I see in the chat says, does the group of townhouses near the water tower have a name and when on the timeline were they developed? 
Yeah. So they, so I don't know. So Summer Hill is the townhouses that are on like facing Fisher Avenue down there, kind of at the corner of Fisher and, um, sorry, I'm just trying to go back to this. So, um, you can see Summer Hill in the red there. Um, it's in that first. So they were they were kind of built around the same time as as Westerly. At least that 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 section that's facing Fisher. Now, as you kind of go up Wooten towards the water tower, um, I I my understanding is that they're all in the 70s as well. Um, George, correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I think they're all in the 70s. I'm just, I'm not sure when exactly they came on, but they're, they're in kind of that early stage of development. Do we have any more questions? Um, on, on these two photos, Kenny, can you point out the water tower? Yeah, so um, I know it's small, but so, uh, well, so the water tower is not in the left one, obviously, but it would be if we if we see you can see the track there on the right 2020 kind of the oval. And so if you think about the water tower kind of sits basically like right above it. It's, I think it's kind of that little white dot there. That would be the water tower. Any last questions? Well, speaking of water towers, a lot of people don't realize there's also a half a million gallon uh, standpipe over in uh, Brightwell. Right. Yep. Yep. That's right. When was the water tower put up? George, do you know that? That was you here should. when we moved here in 73. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not sure how old it was. Yeah, it was, I mean, only, a year, it was only a couple of years old at that time, I believe. Yeah, it might have. I mean, you know, so they finished that initial kind of sewer system in the late '60s, so it might have been kind of coming online around then. But mm -hmm. well, if we have no further questions, as always, you can. Send them to info at posableseniors.org if you think of them later or comment them on our Facebook and we'll pass them along to Kenny for you. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's presentation as much as I did and learned something new. If you'd like to unmute or turn on your camera to say goodbye, now's the time. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, please leave a like and a comment. We'd like to thank Kenny for this presentation, as well as our ongoing sponsors and private contributors that help us keep our programs going because we love putting them on for you. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider joining us for more upcoming events. This time next week, we'll be back with Genealogy and You, discovering your family's history. It'll be so interesting. We've got someone from Montgomery County Libraries and he's going to go through all of the resources that the library offers that can help you in discovering your own family history. So be sure to check that out. You can go to our website at posableseniors.org for more info and registration. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you.